please open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. And we'll be in chapter 2 and chapter 3 this evening as we continue in our series on transcendent truth. And I hope that it will be a real help for you. Uh, so 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, chapter 2, uh, 1 John. And uh, when you find your place, I'd like to look down at verse 11 and then we'll just, that'll be the only read, verse we read in chapter 2 and it'll be in chapter 3. And so we'll get some transcendent truth, transcendent truth truth this evening. If you don't know where 1 John is, it's near the end. There, right after 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, then there's Jude, which is about, in most Bibles, about a half a page, and then, or a full page, and then Revelation. So, if you find Revelation in your Bible and work back, you should be able to find 1st John, or as it's become more popular to say, 1 John. One John, uh, you know who says that, right? Who who does that? It says for one and two instead of first and second. And Ravi Zacharias, Ravi Zacharias does it that way. So, and Donald Trump. First John, chapter two, verse eleven. <laughs> but he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. And then chapter 3, and we want to look at verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Father, help us this evening to see how practical love is. We ask for your help now with our understanding, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do not be confused about the theme of 1 John. 1 John is not a gospel. John understands the gospel, by the way, being the one who wrote uh, John, the gospel of John. Okay, and I'd like to just mention that because many individuals will preach the gospel uh, by taking verses, cherry-picking verses, like out of the context of what we looked at this evening about if a person hates his brother, he's a murderer, and no murder abideth in the truth. And so they're saying, well, if you, don't, if you hate someone, you're not a Christian. Well, that actually isn't John's point, and that isn't the Gospel either. John isn't confused about it, and neither should you or I be. Does that make sense? In other words, John is not saying, here's how you're born again. But he begins the letter, 1 John, explaining how to have fellowship with God. And if you will do the things that, first, that John lays out in this letter, you'll have fellowship with God and you'll have fellowship with the brethren. And my friend, fellowship is wonderful. There is nothing like being all alone. Nothing quite like being all alone. I was talking to somebody last week and uh, was talking about what it's like sometimes when you're in a strange place and you don't have anything or any way of getting in touch with anybody, how you can be in the middle of a city and you can really feel like you're just all alone. You ever been there? You ever lost your ID or not had it with you, not had your cell phone, and you needed to get a hold of somebody or in touch with someone? And even though maybe you're not in an uninhabited place, you just feel like, wow, like, I'm all alone. And then you know what the difference is between really just having one friend? Between having nobody and one friend? If you have one friend, it's like you've got everything. It's like everybody. If that friend is a real friend, they'll do anything for you that you need. And it's like the very opposite of being alone. And so it's just amazing how fellowship, friendship, makes the difference. And as pertains to believers, 
being out of fellowship with God and being out of fellowship with other believers, my friend, is worst case possible scenario. You have no one on earth that relates to the struggle that you're going through that understands the purpose that you have like the brethren. Lost people just don't understand the decisions believers make, do they? A lost person says something like, hey man, you just got to look out for yourself. You just got to take care of yourself. You got to make sure you're okay. Take care of yourself first and then everything else after that. And that isn't how a believer actually thinks. A, lost, a saved person says, well, first of all, you've got to make sure that you're in God's will. That what you're doing is right. And then secondly, you've got to make sure that you, put your, that you serve others rather than uh, having others serve you. It's an opposite. In other words, as long as everyone else is okay, who cares about me? That really is the way a believer ought to think. Now, I'm not saying you know, we can overlook glaring fault or glaring sin. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that as long as everyone else has what they need in life, as long as I can serve them, and as long as they have what they need, who really does? I mean, what difference does it make about me? For people who have eternal life, the worst case scenario isn't bad at all. And that's a difference between how we think. But sometimes we fall into the way the world thinks. And, my friend, one of the things that we find out is that the world doesn't love us. Newsflash. The devil doesn't love you, and the world doesn't love you. Sin is not your friend. Oftentimes it presents itself as so appealing, and the world presents themselves as such, uh, with such an appeal that we think, the world loves me, the believers don't love me, but the world does, and it's just a lie, it's an opposite. It lies about the truth, and it, tell, and, and, and it lies about itself. It, it, it calls truth evil, good evil, and evil good. So the only people in the world that really understand you are believers. When a believer is not in fellowship with God, actually, the thing that God uses to chastise a believer who is in open continual sin is to put them out of fellowship. That ought to help us to understand how serious a need fellowship actually is. If nothing gets to a believer who is in gross sin, like being put out of the church, it ought to help us to understand how important fellowship is. Secondly, if anyone ought to understand how much fellowship means, it ought to be people who are in fellowship. It's a transcendent truth this evening. I hope you won't overlook it. We as believers ought to know, ought to understand the importance of fellowship with one another and with Jesus Christ, with God. We need it, folks. And if we need it, we need to provide it. Now, 1 John deals with fellowship, but it talks as well about the manifestation of fellowship among believers. We saw in chapter 2, in verse 11, the Bible says, But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. It is a tragic truth that oftentimes believers fall out of fellowship with one another and even will get into a relationship where they actually want evil or they actually have hatred in their heart toward those who are their brethren. My friend, if bitterness and hatred have come into your heart toward the brethren, if you wish evil for someone who is a child of Christ, regardless of whether they've done evil to you or not. If you wish evil to someone, my friend, the Bible says that it's reflective of us. The Bible says there is darkness in us. Now, you may not want to hear this truth this evening, but I promise you it is the source of your problem. It's a transcendent truth. There are so many believers 
who do not love their brothers and sisters in Christ, and the result of it is that there's darkness in their lives. That's what 1 John 2 verse 11 says. The Bible says, He that hateth his brother is in... What's the next word? Darkness. darkness. And walketh in... Darkness. Okay. Sometimes we read something, and if we don't take the time to stop and really think about it, we don't really comprehend what the Scripture is saying. Walking in darkness. You know what that is, right? Okay, if this world is not our home, and it isn't, is it? If we are sojourners, that is, we are temporarily on this earth, and being with God, eternity, we have an eternal home, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. If that's our home, then that ought to be the place we know well, and we're strangers here on this earth. There's nothing like being in a strange place in the dark. Is there? It removed. It removed. And you know, you were used to where you lived. Have you ever just change the side of the bed that you get up on? My wife has bed rules. Like when we got married, she said, no, that's your side of the bed. That's the side you always sleep on. We never agreed on it. She said, oh, yeah, it's because of, you know, this pain or whatever. We never had an agreement on it. I just thought, you know, hey, it's our bed, and whoever wants to sleep on whatever side can. But we have, even when we stay in a strange place, we have her side and my side. And so if you're at the foot of the bed facing the bed, she's on the right, I'm on the left, and uh, vice versa. I don't know why, why it is that way, but I have to figure it out when I go in a hotel room or I'll get moved if she comes to me. You know, like, you're on my side of the bed, you know. This is, this is pretty true, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty true. Okay. So, anyway, sometimes you say, well, you're taking up the whole bed. Yeah, because I don't believe in having sides. I just think, you know, the whole thing is fair game. It's ours, you know. If you want some of it, just lay, lay on top of me or something. You know, there's plenty of it, you know, if, if you, you utilize the space however you have to. And I do tend to stretch out. Uh, anyway. When I do get up on the wrong side of the bed, uh, you can't be on the wrong side of the bed and roll over, you know. You know what happens? This did happen. Hey, and it was on the wrong side, wasn't it? Remember when I fell, when our, our first year we were married, I fell out of bed? Remember I, yeah, we were in Delray, and I hit the floor in the middle of the night. Do you remember that? I mean, just like a concrete floor, and I hit it really hard. Oh, no. Like just, bam, fell out of bed. It, I think it woke me up. <laughs> is that where the bed rules came from okay that was on the other side of the bed maybe that's what happened maybe maybe I rolled over the wrong way you know but I you know I have come pretty close you know to just like oh can't roll that way you're wrong side of the bed in the dark when you can't see obstacles arise or pitfalls can be in front of you and that's the way it is when we hate our brethren. The Bible says a person who hateth his brother is in darkness, has darkness in them, and the Bible says walks in darkness. Have you ever run right into something in the dark? And walking in the dark, and I mean just something got you right in the nose? I've, I've gotten better. It's been a long time since I've been badly hurt at night, and it's because of the way I walk in darkness now. You know, I have... Uh, the worst thing ever, okay, is the half-open door. <laughs> and it's right here, right? Mm -hmm. Bam! Ooh, oh, the nose, man. It just that's something about hitting that nose. Just like this, just walking. You know, and I've hit doors pretty hard, haven't I, sweetheart? I mean, it's like, bam! You know, say, did you break the door? <laughs> Not, are you okay? Did you break the door? I'm kidding. She doesn't really say that. She's like, oh, honey, are you all right? <laughs> you know, but... Uh, you're walking, you know, and you're just fine. You know, I, I'm minus 700 in both eyes. So darkness uh, with poor vision compounded is really dark. So you're like this, you know, and you can might as well just shut your eyes because they're not doing anything for you. <laughs> so you go like this and wham! The Bible says, He that hateth his brother walketh in darkness.
Because if you think as a believer that you can harbor hatred in your heart for another believer and it will have no ill effect upon you, but it will give you opportunity either for vengeance or for some kind of a festering of that evil to have some kind of a satisfaction in your heart, the Bible says, He walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because darkness hath blinded his eyes. And so, Christian, listen to me now. You can't hate your brother and be okay. You can't hate your brother and have God say, well, it's not a big issue. It's a fellowship issue. It's a blindness issue. And you will certainly run into something or fall into something as a result of what's in your heart, that hatred. Okay, go to chapter 3. Chapter 3. Uh... Verse 13, the Bible says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Don't be amazed if the world hates you. We've had that explanation before, haven't we? About the world hating us. If they hated Jesus, then it makes sense that they would hate us. And the servant's not greater than his Lord. The Scripture explains that in many places. Verse 14 of 1 John 3. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. Okay? It's not okay to hate your brother, but there's a benefit in loving your brother. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to present things in a positive light. I'm not one of these nut jobs that thinks that you have to reward people into good behavior all the time. That gets a little frustrating sometimes, doesn't it? Uh, we were talking about on Sunday on the bus about how that gifts really become rewards on the basis of the whole Santa Claus notion, you know? It, you know, if if you've been good, then you get presents, and if you haven't been bad, then you get coal. I, you know, you can make diamonds out of coal, so I'm not sure where that, you know, the negative of that is, but I'm sure it is somewhere, unless you're not innovative. Uh, anyway, but the reality of it is, is that gifts are actually free, aren't they? Uh, they're not earned, and we've kind of made gifts uh, something the opposite of that. But the Bible says here, this isn't a gift, this isn't a do, do this and you'll have something, but this is a positive of loving Christ. In other words, it's sinful and there are consequences for hating your brother. And the opposite is actually true. If you love your brother, the Bible says, practically speaking, that we are able to know that we've passed from death unto life. Is there a better satisfaction from any experience, any acquisition, or anything you can do than just simply having assurance of your salvation? Can you get a better feeling from anything than just knowing that you're, that you're saved? No. You honestly can't. I mean, you can have experiences that give you a euphoric effect. You can have experiences that make you feel good. But my friend, there is just nothing like the confidence of knowing that you have eternal life. And if you love your brethren, the Bible says that you'll know, you will know that you've passed from death into life. We know that we have passed from death into life. It's a causal word because we love the brethren. And then there's the negative in that verse. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Again, the question is first John explaining salvation? No, but the word abide is living. It's a living word, and a person who is abiding in hatred is abiding in death. He's living like he's dead, same way that Paul explains in Romans chapter 6, that a person who's dead to sin and is alive to Christ shouldn't live like they're dead to sin because it makes no sense in the same way, it makes no sense for someone who has eternal life to hate his brother or not love his brother because he's living like he's dead when he's actually alive. And we as believers need to understand not only the value but the importance of living life, living as though we're alive. The Bible says, as more strong, puts it more strongly, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. You ever see somebody get in a real fight? Like a real fight, like a fist fight, or like, you know, really trying to, you know... What's the goal of a fight? 
Win. Okay, to win. How do you win? Beating the other guy Yeah, taking the other guy out, right? Okay. I I don't want to get in fights. Don't want. I want to avoid fights. I'll tell you why. Because a fight is actually, uh, you know, the Old Testament talks about fights. Anthony and I were actually talking about today about manslaughter and about capital punishment and that sort of thing. You know what will happen if you're successful in beating somebody up? Dead. You'll kill them. That's what will happen. Now, you say, that's not my intended consequence. Well, actually trying to do harm to somebody, trying to hurt somebody, the intended consequence is to eliminate them, to kill them. Now, you may want to not go too far to have consequences yourself, but the hatred that's in you that would cause you to want to do harm to someone else is the same thing that causes murder. In other words, you go out and try to knock a guy out, you know, you're wanting to kill him. And if you succeed at it, you did it on purpose. I mean, that's the reality of it. And the Bible says, He that hateth his brother is a murderer. <laughs> God's pretty clear about it, isn't He? Whereas if you have hatred in your heart towards someone that you're supposed to love, God says you're a murderer. You commit a murder in your heart. You're a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Now, is the Bible here saying that loving people is the way to be saved? No. Then what is it saying? Well, have you ever met a uh, believer who hates someone? No. I have. I met some bitter believers. I mean, you can't talk to them without them telling you what they hate about someone or who they hate. You say, "Well, Pastor, they're not saved." Then, well, let's let's recap. How do you get saved? Faith. By faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, if they've been saved by faith in Christ alone, is that what saves them, or is it loving people that saves them? What's salvation from? Is salvation the gift of God, or salvation works of love? It's a gift of God, right? Because the Scripture here is not saying a person who's saved is incapable of hatred. The Bible says that a person who has abiding, who is abiding in Christ has love in them. See that word abiding? John uses the word abiding. Abiding means living there. Living there. And you don't have life or eternal life living in you if you have hatred living in you. Literally, hatred or murder being in a person is darkness, being in darkness. You know, there are Christians who are just walking around murderers inside. Now, does that mean that the Holy Spirit's no longer there? No, it means He's quenched. It means that life isn't abiding. In other words, there's no life emanating out of a person who's full of hatred. And a person who hates is a murderer. And John is here making a very, very strong statement to help people understand that this is indeed not just a small matter. I don't, you know, Pastor, you know, I'm just not going to forgive them. Well, I'm going to just tell you something. You're also going to be in darkness. And you're also a murderer. You know, it's one of the worst things you can call somebody who isn't actually, hasn't actually committed the act of murder. Besides a Trump supporter. <laughs> two, my, my two favorite things to call somebody. <laughs> One of the worst things you can call somebody. You ever heard the person that doesn't think they need to be saved because they've never killed anyone? I've never killed anyone. You ever hated someone? The Bible says you've killed someone. You're a killer. You're a hater. you got murder in your heart. There's no difference between you and a murder. The only difference is you know, just an action. But God judges the heart. That's God's standard. Christian, can I just tell you that this is a big deal? In other words, if you ignore this truth, you'll be out of fellowship with God. And if you don't ignore this truth, you're going to run into all kinds of obstacles and pitfalls in your life. You're going to have big problems. It's going to be a major hindrance in your life if you don't love the brethren. It's a big deal. You know, we overlook it sometimes. We allow it sometimes. But this is a transcendent truth. The Bible says in verse 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. 
And we ought to lay down our lives for brethren. How do you know God loves you? He said so, but ultimately because he laid down his life. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. What if God lays down his life for a man? Understanding the implications of a holy, perfect, sinless God sacrificing his life for sinful, ungodly men who are actually his enemies because of their sin. That's love, isn't it? My friend, if anyone in the world ought to reflect love, it's us. We ought to. We ought to love the brethren. <laughs> friend, you, no one ought to be more patient, more tolerant, more kind, more loving. Not of sin, but of idiosyncrasies. Syncrasies. There's, you know, Christians ought to get under your skin. You ought to have patience for believers. The reason you ought to have patience for them is because you love them. The Bible says, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelt the love of God in him? Sorry about your luck, buddy. <laughs> Hope you figure it out. But that's not the way brethren work. If a brother in Christ has a need... And you shut up your bowels of compassion. The question John asks, it's a hypothetical question. How is that God's love in you? How does God's love dwell in you? And the answer is, well, not very effectively. And then he concludes by saying, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Everyone has a different language, right? Some people need affirmation or things to be spoken to them. The reality of it is, is that love toward the brethren is not said or stated. It's not in word. It's not in a statement. It's in what you do. How does an individual who loves someone show that they love them? What? Their actions. By their actions. If you really liked somebody, if you really, really cared about someone, you'd want to serve them. Right? you want to do something for them. If you really like somebody, you want to buy them something or get them something or do something for them. That's the way I feel when I, can, when I really love someone. I have someone I love, comes to town, I want to entertain them, I want to feed them. I want to make them feel comfortable. I want them to have a good time. And I'll work really hard to make sure they do. You know why? Because I love them. And I want them to know I love them. And I don't say, hey, you know, hope you have a good time while you're in town. No, it's, can I do this for you? Not can I do anything for you, but could I do this for you? Do you need this? Do you need that? What can I do? for you. And Christian is practical. Love acts. And the Bible says that we as believers are not to hate. On the opposite end, we are to love. And that our love isn't stated. It doesn't mean anything to a visitor of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church if we tell them we love people. Matter of fact, we don't even state it that much. A lot of times when visitors come to our church or our people come to our church, I'll tell them Jesus loves them. And I'll say, we love you very much, but the honest truth of the matter is, is that they'll know if you love them or not. A church can make it their slogan or their motto and it's meaningless unless they do things to show you that they love you. Isn't it true? It's just a big difference between someone saying they love you and someone acting as though they love you. None of us are perfect in this area, are we? Every one of us could grow in this area. But my friend, the transcendent truth behind this is that there's a lot of benefit for the believer who learns to love in deed and in truth. You say, well, Pastor, I don't know if it's a big deal. Well, my friend, it's such a big deal that the Bible says that if you don't love the brethren, that you walk in 
darkness. It's such a big deal that the Bible says you know not what you stumble. It's such a big deal that the Bible says that you are a murderer and no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. It's such a big deal that you cannot be in fellowship. It's a big deal. And yet, believers are content to overlook something like hatred in the heart of a Christian. And sometimes as believers, we're content to overlook hatred in our own hearts. And then on the flip side, you say, well, I don't hate anybody. Well, here's the question. Do you love them? Do you love them? And we're so quick to overlook the benefits of love and the need of love, the necessity of love, and then the requirement for love. That it not be in word, but that it be in deed. And friend, that's what we need in our church. Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. That's what we need in our lives. We need to love people in what we do. It's a transcendent truth. It's a practical one. If you overlook it, it'll be a stumbling block. If you embrace it, it'll be a door that opens all kinds of things for you as a believer. It's amazing, isn't it, as we said in the beginning, how something, one little thing, can just stop you can actually get you out of the way, out of fellowship with God. And the very same thing can be the thing that opens up a door and gives you opportunity. And this is one of those things in the Christian life which is a transcendent truth. I hope it's a help to you. Father, thank You for what Your Word expressly, explicitly states, and I ask that You would help us in the application of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's uh, take prayer requests tonight. Yes, Melissa. For Sophia, she had some tests today. Okay. Um, All right. Results for that, just for the pain that she's in right now. Okay, pray for Sophia for her test results and for the pain. Mr. Warney, Mr. Warney, can you say something? I can only. Imagine, like any can imagine, the pain that Jesus went through when he put the, the, the nail through him. Yes. He just put a little needle through me, and I thought I was going to pass out. You know, the pain was excruciating, and it still hurts. You wouldn't believe how painful it was. Because, you know, he had to go deep inside. And I can only, I says, Lord, I'm trying to imagine what I cannot imagine. Somehow, the pain that he went through endured with me. Yeah. Thank you for your prayers. All right. Okay. Who else? Yes, Tashi? Hey, I just want to, um, different kind of prayer, just pray, you know, uh, pray for thanks, you know, thanks God for, uh, a lot of the positive momentum and you know blessings that I, you know, I feel that I'm receiving and like noticing and feeling, you know, I just feel on a different beat. You know, and I think that we should uh, all pray and just keep in mind for the church and the growth and uh, you know the positive outlook on this church. I mean, this is a gift for all of us. So let's pray for that and pray God for that. You know, that's, like, that's how I feel about it. I just want to say that and say thank you. Thank all you guys and thank you guys as well. Okay, all right, so Tosh just wanted to share just a praise that, of the things that God's working and doing in his life and the mm -hmm. blessings of it. Thank you for sharing that, brother. Mm -hmm. And, man, we want to share it with everybody. I yeah. want to let everybody have a piece of this. Tell people that we have a fellowship here. Yeah. That we've got a, a real church family. And uh, it's, it's really a wonderful blessing to be able to have that. Thank you for, thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Who else tonight? Angela. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Yes. That's Lisa, the lady that comes with Charles on Sunday mornings. And he's not sure if she, if she understands the gospel. And so... Uh, Pray that that would just become clear to her and that she would know for sure that she has eternal life. Okay? 
Sophia? Yes, my friend, Faiza, my, my Pakistani Muslim friend, mm -hmm. when I told her, you know, she noticed what's wrong with me and stuff, she said her heart hurts. And then she told me, very, she barely whispered it, but she said to me, she's going to pray. And this time she's going to pray to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, God hears that prayer. Yeah. Amen, he does. And, you yeah. know, but the thing is, we have to keep it confidential because we don't want to far from Christ to find out. That's very dangerous. Yeah. What's the name of Faiza. F I A Z A. Okay. Faiza. All right. Who else? Emily? For um, Starge's cousins to get saved. Yep. Yeah, pray for Starge's cousins to get saved. Let's go to the Lord. Well, Chuck? Pray for Mike Cross. Yeah, did you hear from him? Okay. Pray for Michael. All right. Father, <clears throat> Lord, there's so many things that we can offer you praise for, and so many things that we can be thankful for. The cross, Lord, the, the shame that you bore becoming our sin, God, the wrath of God that was directed on your Son for us. Lord, just the sacrifice that You made is such a wonderful thing that Jesus Christ related to us without sinning and showed us a way. Gave us a free gift of eternal life and gave us a way to live. Help us to follow His example. Father, I pray for Sophia's testing and just for the physical strength that she needs to go through to find out about this cancer. God, I pray, praise you for Tashi's just praise that, God, that you are working in his life and that you're opening his opening avenues and, and giving him direction. And I just pray that you continue to do that, give him victory in his life that he needs. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray for Lisa. Uh, and, God, that you would just be with the things that she's struggling with and going through now and, and uh, for her salvation. God, I pray for Faiza, and I just ask, God, that she would just help her to know what love is and to protect her and help her family to be saved. And God, I pray I pray for uh, all of Nash and Jamancy and Starge and tonight as cousins to be saved. And then, Lord, I pray for Michael Cross as well. God, I pray for the folks that we visited and knocked on doors. Lord, and for so many people in our church that are just struggling with uh, different, different circumstances in life, and I just ask that you would help them to have victory. We thank you so much for what you're going to do now. And thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All done. Hey everyone, I made a pie. And I don't want you, I want you guys to have a piece. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is it better?